This talk will be in English, so I think I'll just start off in English. It's a great honor giving this talk. Uh, I think I was first approached uh, with the suggestion to give a talk here by Trygve Helgoker. So thanks very much to Trygve. Um, the very first talk on this subject I gave in Tromsø at the Norsk Kjemiselskap at the request of the head of that organization, uh, led by Rune Einrem, who is happily also here today. So without further ado, I'll uh, continue with the talk. The grammar of the elements. Did the Sanskrit alphabet influence Mendeleev's periodic table? So you'll see I have two colors, red and blue, and in essence, this will be two stories. One will be about Mendeleev, and one will be about Sanskrit. And since most people, at least in the West, and to some extent even in India, don't know much about Sanskrit these days, so it's useful to explain what Sanskrit is before explaining uh, whether and how it might have influenced Mendeleev. So those are the two stories. They are relatively independent stories, but there is a small sliver of overlap, which you will find at the end. And which story I am referring to, you'll see from the color of the heading as I go on. So Mendeleev articulated his periodic table in a publication in 1869, uh, somewhat over 150 years ago. And you've probably all of you seen the periodic table, even those of you who are not chemists. And you'll see it looks quite different from the periodic table you're used to seeing in your textbooks. If you look carefully, there are some rather obvious things that are wrong in this periodic table. Iron ruthenium is fine, but it certainly doesn't belong in the same row as iridium. Likewise, manganese doesn't belong so, uh, with rhodium and so on. So there are some things that are wrong. Two years later, the periodic table has started to resemble the table that we are used to seeing today. today. The, the resemblance is quite clear. The remarkable thing that he did was he left gaps in the table for elements that had not been discovered. Now, there were other people who had suggested that the elements had periodic properties as you increased the atomic weight at that time. Today we know it's not the atomic weight, it's the number of protons in the atomic nucleus. Anyway, he did something else that was equally remarkable. For these unknown elements, he gave names with certain prefixes that were Sanskrit. Eka, Dvi, and Tri are Sanskrit for one, two, and three. Um, so Eka aluminum, that basically, for, that was for gallium, that means one row removed from aluminum. Uh, Similarly, dvi tellurium means two rows removed from tellurium and so forth. Three manganese is three rows removed from uh, manganese. That's what he thought was rhenium. It's, uh, and eka manganese, that's technetium. That's, that was discovered much later. Mendeleev was aware 
that this was his claim to fame. This was an enormous discovery. This was to chemistry what evolution was to biology and what Newton's laws were to physics. And he marked this extremely important discovery by giving names in Sanskrit. That is very strange. Why would he do that? Soon after he uh, articulated his table, uh, some of his predictions came true. Gallium was discovered and properties that he had predicted for eka aluminum, like atomic mass, density, melting point, and, and so on, they were brilliantly confirmed. Similarly for germanium, which he called eka silicon. So it was an absolutely brilliant success, and he marked it by giving Sanskrit names, which was very unusual. And the question is, why would he do that? You know, just to give you an informal example, I am a great fan of Native American art, but you know, if I discover something <laughs> remotely as important, I would not give it a name that is reminiscent of something in Native American art because it would not be related to me in any way. Uh, that brings us to the second story. What is Sanskrit? So Sanskrit in Sanskrit means refined, purified, uh, it means refined, purified, perfected. And the significance of Sanskrit was recognized by an English judge long ago, uh, well over 200 years ago, he was a judge in uh, Calcutta, in colonial India. He uh, recognized uh, that it was, uh, Sanskrit was very similar to Latin and Greek and to many European languages. And he found the similarities to be so strong that no philologer could examine them all three without believing them to have sprung from some common source. And that common source, the original language, has come to be known as Proto-Indo-European. Proto and the question, of course, is who spoke that language and where did they live? Proto-Indo-European is, uh, is a reconstructed language. It's not a real language. Uh, but there are good grounds for that reconstruction. Uh, OK. Just a little bit about this character, William Jones. He was quite a rebel. Uh, he knew more than 20 languages by the time he was 20-ish or something. He was uh, hired by the king of Denmark, Norway at the time to translate a, Pers a major Persian text of Nader Shah. He was a conqueror who caused a lot of damage in Asia. Uh, Great linguist. He was a rebel, as I said. He was an ancestor, uh, or rather, he was the tutor of Princess Diana's, one of Princess Diana's ancestors. He was an anti royalist. His ideas were seditious, tr treasonable, and diabolical uh, to at least to conservative audiences. And 
He was an early advocate of polyamory, among other things. And he was uh, happy to leave England and settled in India, and that's his tomb in India. Okay, so this is the range of Indo-European languages. Um, this is sort of before colonization took place. So half the world's population speaks an Indo-European language as a first language, and three quarters of the world's population speak it either as a first language or as a second language. This branch that covers India through Iran and a little bit of Turkey here. This is the Indo-Iranian branch. The, the red part is the Germanic branch. The green is the Slavic branch. Here's the Baltic. Here's the Latin branch. And the Greek here. And a few other minor branches here. <coughs> so... A lady, a very famous archaeologist named Maria Jimbutas, in 1963, proposed that the Indo-European languages started from some people in this Pontic Caspian steppe, north of Black Sea, north of the Caspian Sea, and from there they spread into Europe and into India. It was based on uh, she examined artifacts, particularly uh, statues of gods and goddesses. That was her specialty. And she called this culture the Kurgan culture. And Kurgan is supposedly the Russian for a mound. So these are burial mounds. Nowadays, it's typical more typical to refer to this as the Yamnaya culture, Yamnaya, uh, Yamnaya in Russian, which is something I don't know. There are Russian speakers in this room, I know. Um, it, supposed, it supposedly means a pit. So it's sometimes also called a pit grave culture. And so this is the Yamnaya uh, homeland. That's what she proposed based on archaeological evidence. Today we have a lot more evidence about who the Proto-Indo-Europeans were. And what exactly is that evidence? There is evidence from uh, linguistics, there is evidence from archaeology, there is evidence from religion and mythology, there are elements of um, re, um, similarity between Hinduism and the Viking religion, and so on. But um, common phrases, and given that this room is full of very famous people, the very idea of fame, that comes, that is an Indo-European concept. You see it all the time in Homer's work. Uh, Cleos Apthiton is the uh, Greek or the ancient Greek word, and Akshitam Shravas is the Sanskrit word. So, imperishable fame, that's what the Proto Indo Europeans were after. But the most important evidence that has come uh, to dominate our thinking is ancient DNA. And that evidence has basically unfolded in the last. 10 years or so, or 15 years. And here is a very broad brushstrokes summary of the last 10,000 years. And it can be called the tale of two subcontinents, according to David Reich, who is one of the leading figures in the ancient DNA field. So n nine about 9,000 years ago, according to DNA evidence, agriculture first spread from the Middle East. It spread both into Europe, 
and into India and Iran and so on. This was the first major migration. The second migration, major migration, happened about four or five thousand years ago from this Yamnaya homeland. That's what spread the Indo-European languages, supposedly. And in Europe it gave rise to what was called the Corded Ware culture. And it's generally thought that they moved. Uh, this migration was facilitated by horses. Now there is an interesting twist here. I'll come to that. Uh, horses indeed played a major role in their uh, uh, migrations. But this latest twist has come actually in the last year or so. So nowadays, the Yamnaya people, we refer to them in various ways. Uh, st step pastoralists is one way. Um, they called themselves Aryans, but that term was ruined by the Nazis, so uh, people sometimes avoid the term these days. Okay, so... This is the sorry. This is the Yamnaya homeland, and one major migration route was into Europe, where they gave rise to the corded ware culture. Uh, Norway is also covered, but mostly along the coast here. Um, it covered an astoundingly wide range from here way up to there. And from the Corded Ware culture, this was about, this migration happened, let's say, roughly around 5,000 years ago. And this happened 4,500 to 4,000 years ago the Corded Ware people moved into this area of Russia called Sintashta. So the Corded Ware uh, people were about 70% Yamnaya. So uh, the Yamnaya migrations were largely male, and it is theorized that uh, they essentially killed off the local males and replace the population. So the corded ware people here are were thought to be about 70% Yamna. Uh, today, uh, the Yamna um, the population no longer exists because they have mixed, but uh, in Northern Europe, the Indo-European Indo heritage is the most present. So Norway has the highest proportion of Indo-European uh, genes. It's about 51%. So this Sintashta is where uh, efficient chariots were first built. That's what led to the migration into India. And the Sanskrit word for chariot is rata, which is a cognate of rota in Latin or Greek, and it's the cognate of rotation and so on. One of the Hindu gods, the one uh, or other, they are the twin uh, horsemen who s sort of drive the sun on in the sky. They drive a chariot. The twin, in Sanskrit, they are called Ashvino, which is just the duel of a horseman. It just means 
two horsemen. Ashwin is the singular form. It's a very common Indian name also nowadays. Um, so it's interesting that this archaeological uh, model, this, is, this part is gold, this is uh, some other metal, this particular artifact was dug up not very far from here, actually in Denmark, just a little bit north of Copenhagen. And it's probably Denmark's most important archaeological uh, heritage. You can see it in Copenhagen. Um, so these are the corded ware vessels. And this is a reconstructed chariot at a museum in Sintashta. So the Sintashta, cu the Sintashta culture was a, uh, this was in Russia, this is Sintashta. This was a heavily militaristic culture. Uh, this is one of their forts. It's sometimes called the Russian Stonehenge. Um, the chariot was discovered there. This is a cartoon uh, which has been drawn by a modern writer. And so from Sintashta, the Indo-Iranians Indo went south, and then the Aryans went into India, and then the Iranians went into Iran, and they went further to found what is called the Mitanni Kingdom. Or the Mitanni Kingdom is not purely Indo-European, but uh, some elements were. Anyway, so the, the Sintashta people are thought to have entered India around 1500 BC. And they presumably spoke an early form of Sanskrit. By early form, I mean uh, still fully understandable to someone who knows Sanskrit. I mean, it would be... Uh, Sanskrit has been very nicely preserved. So I'm coming to that. Uh, so the Sintashta language would be understandable to someone who, know, who knew Sanskrit. Okay, so when they came into India, there was already a very a major civilization in existence there. That was the Indus civilization. And the text, the early text of the Indo-Europeans, those are the Vedas, they describe uh, the, some of them suggesting a conflict, like Indra, that is the... Indian version of the god Thor, Indra armed with his bolt and trusting in his prowess, he wandered shattering the forts of the Dasas. Presumably that refers to the locals. Active and bright they came, impetuous like bulls, driving the black-skinned far away. So that means the Indo-Europeans were light-skinned and the people who lived there were darker-skinned quelling the rightless dasyu. So religion was extremely important, just as it was with the Vikings. May we think upon the bridge of bliss, leaving the bridge of woe behind. Sounds metaphorical, but there are five great rivers here, um, sort of along the India-Pakistan boundary might be referring to the crossing of those rivers. Um, anyway, the point is, uh, but there is not really a huge amount of evidence that they wiped out the early civilization. As it was once suggested, they rather blended in. There was some conflict, uh, but 
the genetics doesn't suggest that they wiped out the existing civilization or the existing males completely, as completely as they did in Europe. Okay. Veda is the old texts. It means knowledge. It's essentially that word has remained the same. It's vite in Norwegian, vil in Danish, and it's wissen in German. It's very similar. Uh, the writings are extremely, it's a very fine literature. Creation hymns are, or rather creation myths are very similar between what they had in the Vedas and what they have in Icelandic Eddas, even though they are separated by more than 7,000 kilometers and roughly 2,000 years. Uh, and part of it, so I'm not going to go through the creation hymn, but one interesting point is, this is how one of the hymns ends. But after all, who knows and who can say whence it all came and how creation happened? The gods themselves are later than creation. So who knows truly whence it has ar arisen? Whence all creation had its origin, the creator, whether he fashioned it or whether he did not, the creator who surveys it from, surveys it all from highest heaven, he knows, or maybe even he does not know. This particular hymn is uh, echoes one in the Icelandic Edda. It's called the Völuspau. Many of you probably know of that. It's called the prophecy of the Völva, which is, the, I guess, the Nuran word for Cirrus. It This is supposed to be the world's first atheistic or agnostic hymn. So that's kind of interesting. But on the whole, they were very religious and they had a lot of rites and so on. Poetic meters have persisted. That's another thing. Uh, this is Paul Kiparsky, my collaborator in this uh, project. Um, so the poetic meters used by Homer are very closely related to the Sanskrit Vedic meters. And it is thought that a lot of the culture has survived because it was orally taught. So essentially, the entire Sanskrit literature has been preserved orally. It has been written out only uh, recently, several hundred years ago. Uh, and it has survived because it was in poetry form, so it was easy to remember. So that was 1500 BC or so, or 1200 maybe, and then another 700 or 500 years have gone by. And India has changed uh, so that militaristic values are no longer there. And Nonviolence has arisen. This is one of the great Indian epics, Mahabharata. And this is a little jingle. I'll let you read the jingle. But since I haven't pronounced Sanskrit, I might as well read aloud the Sanskrit version. The word for nonviolence is ahimsa. That basically, ah is non. And ahimsa literally means non killing. So, ahimsa paramo dharma stata ahimsa paro damach. Ahimsa paramang dana ahimsa paramastapach. So, that's just to give you an idea of how it sounds. But the whole point is that I'm trying to make here is that there, it's very easy to 
interpret the success that the Indo-Europeans had in planting their language and the culture everywhere they went to uh, and project it onto some idea of white supremacy or nationalism or racism or that kind of thing. And colonialism also was driven substantially by that idea and of course then the Nazism as well. Now, Indian nationalists were, some of them at least, were quite offended by the idea. They, they thought that, oh well, we have this wonderful language and here come the Westerners and they say, no, it came from the West. This is not really part of your culture. And uh, again, it's a very uh, silly way to think about it. It's like saying that just because we believe in evolution, we don't appreciate the grandeur of nature. Because, and what my response to that is, and this is purely my theory, that's why I have the uh, question mark here, is that the civilization that the Indo-Europeans blended with, the Indus civilization, they were largely a pacifist civilization. And when they blended, the Indo-European culture or, and the language dominated, but they also got more civilized and they uh, abandoned their militaristic ways. So a lot of the improvements that happened in Indian culture were indigenous. So there is no really no reason to be offended by the suggestion and indeed by the fact that the Sanskrit language came from outside India. So it wasn't just pacifism. Around 500 BC, something else happened. Sanskrit grammar was formalized. So here's uh, by someone named Panini. And he wrote a grammatical uh, a book of grammar. I shouldn't say wrote, because he formulated. It was probably just memorized. The, the, uh, the book had close to 4,000 rules which organized the whole language. Every aspect of it. Uh, it's a very heavily inflected language that means you can, you have almost free word order. Uh, and Noam Chomsky, great linguist, said that Ashtadhyay, Ashtadhyay basically means the eight chapters, that's the name of the book, uh, provided the first generative grammar in the modern sense of the word, meaning a complete set of rules for combining morphemes, the smallest meaningful units of language, such, such as word roots and stems, prefixes and suffixes, into grammatical sentences. Okay, I should say that even by the time um, the Indo-Europeans came into India, the grammar was not as heavily systematized, but the poetic meters were. So there were hundreds of different poetic meters, like iambic pentameter and so on. Those were there. So those were there not only by the time they entered India, they were there with the Yamnaya. And that's how they also came into, ultimately came into the Norse literature and the Greek literature and so on. Of course, a lot of it has been lost uh, because the Norse literature is about, let's say, 1,200 years old. Uh, uh, whereas in India, that literature 
Of course, a lot has been lost, but a huge amount has survived. So we now come back to Mendeleev, the first story, the blue headlines. He was born in 1834 in a small place in Siberia, youngest of seven, 17 siblings. Uh, traveled to Moscow on a horse cart, which, I, as I recall, broke down several times. They were not a well-off family at all. It's hard to imagine how they would be with 17 kids, but um, was rejected by the university there. He got admitted into a school in St. Petersburg, and there he studied two years in Heidelberg there, and attended the Karlsruhe Congress. Kanitsaro's atomic, he learned about atomic weights there. 1861, he published a book on organic chemistry. 1862, he won a very major prize from the St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences, Demidov Prize, married, and then 1865 became a professor, St. Petersburg State University. 1869, he got tenure and started teaching in organic chemistry. So, and that's incidentally also the year he formulated the periodic table. So, it seems that he was struggling off to find a way to teach chemistry intelligently. I mean, in those days, it was just a wild collection of facts, and he was trying to find something that would make things systematic. And ultimately, that led to the periodic table. Now, there are theories. One legend is that he was, he was writing the names of elements on a card and he, uh, on cards, and he was trying to uh, play a game of memory, and somehow that led to the periodic table. Another is the typical story that he got the idea in a dream. Uh, But a key point is the periodic table was sort of in the air. Many people had noticed the periodic properties, that the element, the properties of the elements change in a periodic manner as you go up the, uh, go up, uh, the atomic weight. One of my favorite examples is the so-called telluric helix. Uh, suggested by th this Frenchman. And you can see that it, it's quite nice. Unfortunately, he published this in a paper, and the graphics is horrible, as you can see, so it was ignored. So coming to the 1871 periodic table and the gaps and the uh, elements with the half Sanskrit names. That's where we are. What would account for it? And what would account for it is this grammarian, this 6th century BC grammarian, Parnini. He formulated the alphabet, wrote down the alphabet of Sanskrit, and that is a periodic table. So the alphabet basically goes like ka, ka, ga, ga, nga. Those are the, come from the, those are the guttural sounds from deep below. And then you have the palatal sound, cha, cha, ja, ja, nga. And then the, from the alveolar ridge, the, these sounds actually are, these are the hard T's and D's, like in English, like in English, 
da ta da dha na and these are the soft t's da ta da dha na uh, these kind these are kind of hard to distinguish between four europeans uh, european audiences and the last one are uh, the sounds made by the lips by smacking your lips pa pa ba ba ma and then there are the fricatives and um and several others so there was a periodic table in existence but in a completely different sphere how would mendeleev know anything about it that's the question i mean he was an underprivileged young man who grew up in siberia how would he know what happened in india uh true these things were being discovered in the west at that time and some of them were fashionable but mendeleev really was not part of that fashionable set so what was his sanskrit connection mid 19th century st petersburg was a major center of oriental studies and one key person in st petersburg was a uh, he has a german name but he was almost a russian otto von bütlink uh he worked down the street from mendeleev's institute and he was a friend of mendeleev and he was one of the greatest sanskrit uh, scholars of the day he uh, translated panini's grammar into german uh so this ashtadhyay which he called the acht bücher grammatische regeln um grammatik mit übersetzung and he sanskrit has a very huge vocabulary so this uh, even a short dictionary ran into seven volumes um okay so he had a, a very high level sanskrit scholar as a friend this guy otto von bütlink was also an enthusiast for siberia where mendeleev was from he also wrote a grammar of the yakut which is one of the siberian languages and this famous prize that i was talking about the demidov prize he was mendeleev's patron so they were we don't know what they did whether they went out to have a beer or whether they went out to get lunch or those details are lost but it's clear they were very very close uh he was like a father figure to mendeleev now the connection is more it's not just the that the sanskrit alphabet is a periodic system if you go back to this periodic table that mendeleev proposed his second periodic table you'll see that he proposed formulas of compounds these are the formulas of hydrides these are the formulas of oxides so he basically proposed rules on what the formulas of oxides and hydrides of various elements would be so implicit in this is the idea of valence how they would combine and part of the reason panini formulated that alphabet was also he formulated rules about how sounds should combine and so phono, uh, phonological patterning basically means how sounds follow each other like uh, you know in 
Swedish, for example, you might say danskt rugbrö, but you would not say that T in Norwegian. You would just say dansk rugbrö. Um, so how sounds combine, how chemical elements combine, there is that. So there is a very deep parallelism between the Sanskrit alphabet and the uh, and the periodic table. So it gets a little technical. The rules are summarized here. Uh, it's Sanskrit is very uh, compact. Uh, so there are little symbols that he used for sets of uh, letters, ikah yong o chi, um, that basically means in place of these sounds, e, u, r, e, use these other sounds before any vowel. So uh, things like that, it goes on and on. And uh, these were some of the things that he was uh, influenced by. So, so chemical combinations and sound combinations. So the idea is Parini's 3959 rules lead to grammatically correct Sanskrit expressions and sentences and only to grammatically correct expressions and sentences. Uh, that's actually an interesting thing. Uh, you can apply these rules and make sentences that would sound really weird in any language, but in Sanskrit they would be perfectly natural. So even if a word is, even if you're stringing together six words, going way beyond what you do in German. If they follow the rules, that's fine. Mendeleev sought a chemical grammar, which you can call a principle of isomorphism, that would lead to the correct chemical formula, such as NaCl and CaCl2, and never to incorrect ones, like NaCl2 and CaCl. So that's sort of the parallelism uh, he basically sought a grammar of the elements. And uh, he wrote this uh, uh, par uh, parallelism. Uh, he was actually not the first to liken chemistry to grammar. That was Lavoisier. And he wrote this, uh, Lavoisier, in 1861, wrote an essay on a theory on the limits of organic combinations. And he talked about, uh, and Mendeleev, no, th th this, this, this was uh, Mendeleev's writing. I'm getting the dates wrong here. And he actually credits Lavoisier for uh, this linguistic way of thinking about chemistry. Because in the past they had, you know, they had weird names for chemicals, pomphilix and alum broth and phagadenic water, colcothar and so on. And he changed that to sodium oxide and potassium oxide and so on. So what Lavoisier said, we think only through the medium of words, languages, our true analytical methods, algebra, which has adapted its purpose in every species of expression in the most simple, most exact, and so on. I have this picture, Lavoisier and his wife, who was his uh, assistant. I show it here because many people now believe that his wife actually did a lot of the research, and she's one of those many, many women who have been written out of history. All right. This idea is 
you know, that the Sanskrit alphabet might have influenced Mendeleev's periodic table is not mine. It arose from this linguist, a very famous linguist. I like to call him the second most famous linguist after uh, Noam Chomsky, is uh, Paul Kiparsky. Uh, so my only contribution to that is, uh, to this story, is uh, I may be the only fluent Sanskrit speaker who is also a practicing chemist. So I am able to evaluate his proposal, and it makes sense to me. That, that's it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>